John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I f***ing love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that Boston next. Big jab there from Duffy and Fred Fear is hurt now. Oh, down goes Duffy O'Connor. Fred Fear does it again. Rock em, sock em, robots here. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self-involved bull artists. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Here we go again. Did they ask for Longo off the top of the show? Is that what the DraftKings Network is asking for? Great to be back in your lives. Monday, June 26, 2023. It is episode 418 of the Anakin Florian Podcast presented by DraftKings. Wherever you may be listening, to quote the great Colin Cowherd, thanks for making us a part of your day. And of course, on the video side, live on the DraftKings Network, on the DraftKings YouTube channel, clips, clips of course, on the Anakin Florian Podcast channel, so Ray Longo in the middle of a very busy Monday. Yeah. So I had to cut my trip to Walt Disney World short because one of my children fell particularly ill. So I emailed the masses this morning to see if we could do the show today, Monday, instead of Tuesday. The one guy who's not on electronic mail, as far as I know, is Ray Longo. And Kenny, as I understand it, Longo had to completely interrupt his entire day, switch up all these sparring <laughs> sessions to make the show work. And that was the opposite of my intention, Ray. Yeah, hey, listen. listen. I was going to say, the Anakin Florian podcast is his priority right now. That, that's commitment right now by Ray Long. Loyalty is big in my book. That's all I got to say. Loyalty is big. Huge. It is interesting. And I can't even talk about this project that is going to involve me and Ray Longo later this year, potentially into next year. But I talked to somebody at ESPN over the weekend. And when I told this person that Ray Longo was one of my best friends, and if I had a second wedding this weekend, that he would maybe be a groomsman. Like you wouldn't be the best man, Ray, but like, dude, I'm telling you, (laughs) if I got married this weekend, like there are not four or five gentlemen that beat you out to be a groomsman. That's how close we have become over the last eight years. So um, I love, I love you, buddy. I love you, too. So we have a lot to get into. Obviously, a UFC fight night that was uh, pretty spectacular. Ken Flo back from PFL 6. Probably happy to have a little respite in the PFL schedule. Uh, Time permitting, uh, whether the overall listenership likes it or not, we probably will get into Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg just for a second because I just want to ask Ken Flo a couple of things on that front. Uh, Big weekend for Longo's locals as well. And, uh, of course, we'll have more picks coming up for UFC fight night. Strickland versus Mago Medov with Brian Petrie towards the end of the show. And uh, I do want to say, Ray Longo, I, I did not intend to uh, open the show bringing up the chair fall from last week. You see, there's oh, no possible man. way that I could fall backwards this week. We're out of my mom's house. Because we moved the show from Monday, from Tuesday to Monday, my mother's not a part of the show today. I was going to have her on and rake her over the coals and tell her to get some new chairs. But the only thing that would have made that chair fall better, Ray, is if it, maybe it happened during the Ray Longo minute. <laughs> Hey, listen, as long as you're all right, man, that's all that matters. You know, the internet, like, the never internet thanks me. you, John, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I yeah, mean, the that, you, you did it you. for the podcast. You did it for the internet. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Kenny sent a message to our group chat. Like, we're going to have to have somebody quarterly fall out of a chair <laughs> just for ratings. Yeah. But Ray doesn't let me hear the end of a lot of things. So had that happened during the Ray Longo minute, I mean, dude, oh, it would have given you a lot of ammunition. But you're taking hey, the listen. high road today, perhaps because we're interrupting you all sweat soaked after yeah. uh, sparring yeah. with Nas. Uh, t- no, no. Why was this far with Nas? I was just watching. Oh, I heard you were in there with him today. Uh, no? Definitely not. Oh. I'd, I'd, I'd get the shit beat out of me. But, uh, now, listen, if it would have happened to me, man, you wouldn't have seen my head pop up for probably 20 minutes. You know, I would have been lost. So I had my hat's off to you. You bounced back like a champion, buddy. Right. Yeah, he did. Get knocked down well, thanks, six buddy. times. Get up seven, baby. You there were you right go. up there. I love it. So, uh, Ken Flo, speaking of bouncing back, I'm curious how you're holding up with this PFL grind. Right. So for me, it's pretty rare. We'll all have a stretch of UFC events where I'm doing like five and six weeks back to backs. I've done three in a row is exceedingly difficult. And you just did at least three in a row in Atlanta, right? I mean, there's nothing easy about it, right? Like I always tell people like you can't over prepare for these shows, right? Like there's always one more thing you could do. And I think that's part of my anxiety, Um, but nothing easy about the back to back to back rippers. So how did that all go for you in terms of the preparation and that navigation kit? Yeah, no, not at all. It it, it is tough. Um, You know, three weeks in a row is tough. There was also a little trip to Boston back home in between. That's that. right. So there, there, there's always something going on. You know, I, I'm lucky that the flights weren't very far. The, the, 
the long flights do a number on my back uh, more than anything uh-huh. else. But so my, my body's feeling okay, but yeah, it is a grind. I mean, I, you know, better than anyone, right? It's like you're finishing up, you know, way past midnight, you know, then you're kind of still wired. You don't really go to sleep till two 30. Uh, you, you're on an early flight back home. So then you, you have a car picking up around five 30 in the morning. So you have three hours of sleep. You go home, you know, you're with the family. So it's that kind of thing that kind of, can throw you off uh week after week but uh, i'm here i'm doing it no complaints we're right you who know. just made you smile like that my goodness I uh, hope some, was somebody that. somebody who's training their dad was uh leaving so i, I okay all right no i was on the podcast but very nice right. very nice right. man thankfully they can't all hear us and some of the right. uh, <laughs> exactly. inappropriate content that comes yeah. up here on the end foreign podcast uh ray nothing inappropriate about uh Ken Flo's facial hair conversation in our pre-show meeting. Where did Ken Flo's beard go, Raymond? Uh, I'll tell you what, but he, auburn and brown and black, and it is nowhere to be seen. I think he, uh, I tell you, he looks like he's 30 years old, though. I'm he telling you, this dude, man. I mean, I don't, this that's is crazy, chubby, though. He's, yeah. He's, yeah. 1976. There's no way, dude. It is <laughs> unbelievable. You know what's interesting, too? We talked about Dr. Scotty on the podcast last week. This dude's offering to inject my face with stem cells as well, Ken Flo. I don't know if he's trying to tell me something. Right. Yeah, I know. He was. He's like, we can inject anything. I was like, <laughs> I mean, right. Okay. Wait, my back. Yeah. <laughs> right. I didn't, I didn't wait, my back, wait, Thanks, though, wait, doctor. Wait, has, has anybody had success with the stem cells? Like, literally, where you felt a difference? So I know people who have realized great success with PRP injections. I know Dominic Cruz right now for him. The jury is still out. He's trying to yeah. mm-hmm. employ stem cell treatment for his shoulder, but uh, he's not out the other side. That's a good question. Yeah, because, I mean, I tried PRP on the hip. It just didn't do anything. Maybe I should have did yeah. a couple, but uh, yeah. I, don't, I, I think, think it what, depends on the location, Ray, yeah. what I've been hearing. So, yes, uh, but I've heard I've heard very good results from certain people. I know Brian Stan got it in his shoulder way back when before they even have the technology that they have now. And he said it was definitely uh, a game changer for him. You know, Beautiful. certain people in the knees and the, you know, uh, certain location yeah. shoulders are supposed to do great. I, I don't know. I, you know, I'm still trying to get more information, but I'm curious. I'm willing to try anything. Yeah, yeah. It looks like it's got promise. It just hasn't. I yeah. haven't heard around here. I have people right. went to Mexico. They were in Colombia. Yeah. Over, yeah. You know. Yeah. No, I'm trying to drag Ken Flo to Tijuana in December to spend Christmas with me instead oh. of his family. But <laughs> no, it's an interesting navigation, right? When you talk about for me, a shoulder, him, a back, avoiding surgery. And I wouldn't be going this long on this if I didn't think it had some value to our yeah. audience. Right. But at least trying to avoid surgery. Right. At all costs. And that's sort of my initiative. Yeah. And uh, I don't see, at least in my limited research to this point in time, that there's much downside if it doesn't work. Uh, but let us dive into all the mixed martial oh, arts man. that has happened over the last seven days or so. And let us begin, if we could, with Ilya Topuria Raymond. Ooh, I'll start with you. Let's do it. You know, he's a big game player, and that says nothing of his vast skill set and the tremendous support system of coaches. I think sometimes when you have a guy like this who is – While training, he's off the radar. You don't hear a lot from him in Spain. You know, he has these magical quotes about seeking perfection in training. And uh, this was a near perfect performance. He did get touched a few times, certainly by a gamer than ever, Josh Emmett. There was a big connection by Josh Emmett in that fifth round after many people thought the fight could have been stopped after four. But what were your thoughts on just a wild main event and a dominant performance for the Spaniard, Ilya Topoi? Yeah, I mean, first thing that comes to my head and while I was watching is the beauty that is in simplicity. That's what was going through my head. Here's a guy. Here's the difference in the fight. You had one guy punching in balance and one guy punching out of balance, leaping forward. Big shots could always land something, but one guy was always in balance and he worked behind that jab beautifully. Uh, I give the guy a 10, 10 on the fight IQ. Just when yeah. the fifth round, the only chance this guy had would be to come back with a huge shot, which he was trying. He answered that bell, man. He came out like you could say, stop it. Listen, this is what these guys decide to do. But he responded. He knew what he needed to do. Just at that time, he gets taken down. You know what I mean? So, again, fight IQ wise, give the guy a 10 out of 10. Uh, Just a simple, beautiful performance. Those are the performances that I love, man. They just what he do. He had a jab, some combos, good defense, a couple of leg kicks. Top of the yeah. world. I, I can't say enough about how beautiful that fight was for me to watch. And that's that's what I like at a at a fighting is what I saw from Ilya Tapuria that night. 
Kenny, I think the height of your value is sort of analytically after big performances like this involving elite fighters. So I will lay out and uh, let you sound off on what you saw out of Ilya Topoli over the weekend. Yeah, you know, I, I was kind of waiting for this kind of performance. Um, this is the one where it sells me completely, where I'm like, okay, this is not only a guy that will fight for the belt, he could win the belt. He might be one of the few who could actually challenge Volkanovsky uh, in all those different domains that is mixed martial arts. Um, and I think Ray said it beautifully, just beautiful fundamentals and what i yes. like about his movement and his balance is the fact that he has his feints and movement everything built in together like there is no like he's constantly in a nice rhythm and then he'll change up that rhythm and throw you off he can counter you he can go first he can go second um his exits are really pretty like he'll land a shot he'll get away you know and, and this is a guy in, in Ilya who i wasn't quite sure um, if he was you know, so disciplined defensively, this one against Emmett, he had to be. Very. And he was absolutely that. And for, for Josh Emmett, to me, it seemed like he was winging punches. He was hoping that Topuria was going to be in a specific spot and he would just throw a huge shot. Topuria yes. was calculating every damn thing that was going out there, how he got in, how he got out. You know, he was throwing Emmett off balance, or maybe Emmett was throwing himself off balance because right. he was trying to wing punches so hard. But either way, Topuria um, put on a master class and showed that he ha he is at a different level and he is ready for the next level. Maybe totally. I shouldn't have gone so deep on the stem cell stuff because I think we could spend 20 minutes on this fight itself. Yeah. On the Josh Emmett side, he's 38 years of age and – has fallen short against two fighters that I think we would all classify as elite now and Yair Rodriguez and Ilya Topuria. 2018, five years ago, Josh Emmett, post-Jeremy Stevens fight, suffered from vertigo, multiple facial fractures, an internal fracture of the orbital floor. This is a guy in the past who has had bone marrow injected from his back into his knee and i understand that he still believes that he is in the shape of all these featherweights and he proved as much this weekend and i do still look at the top seven top eight and see winnable fights for josh emmett this was a big setback obviously in terms of his championship aspirations at 38 years of age but is it fair of me as a fan of mixed martial arts ray and as a fan of josh emmett the individual to ask if like sustaining damage like this is you know, worth the price of admission, right? Because we're going to get into the 10-7 round four scorecard from Chris Lee that I'm in support of, right? And I'm going to get you the language on all of that and what constitutes a 10-7 round. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting softer, but I just don't love seeing a guy who's had historically facial issues, uh, you know, absorb this type of damage, man. It's just hard for me to watch. I don't know. Yeah, no, look, I think you have every right with that opinion. Uh, but I tell you, when... You go to the dictionary and you look up tough motherfucker. Oh. It says Josh Emmett. This guy is tough. Even after a 10-7 round, he came out in that fifth round winging. Like, again, it's not like he was told to do something and he didn't do it. He did of exactly. Course. He did the only thing he could have done at that point. That was it. You know what I mean? And if the fight didn't get taken down and he started getting lumped up, I think then it's a case to, you know, maybe get him out of there. But. Uh, you had to give him his shot and he responded appropriately. Look, as long as these guys know what they're in for, John, that's the problem, right? They do know what they're in for. They trained for those type of beatings. I think at least they, they should be. And right. it, it's, 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 it's just a, e each guy is different, but yeah. Josh Emmett would no, not have wanted that it. fight. So, yeah, I mean, like again, can he take it? Can he not take it? Look, at the end of the day, guys, this shit is not good for you. You can't think any of it's good for you. you know, I, yeah. I tell you, I used to have a doctor, right? He didn't even want to get jabbed in the head. Like, no, I don't want no no head trauma at all. Like, I said, light. You go, no. You know what I mean? So th you, as long as you know what the consequences are and you're well-educated on everything and what could happen and you decide to do it, it's like, you know, jumping out of an airplane, you know, doing yeah. uh, whatever that is. I mean, you got to know the – the responsibility and or the repercussions that could happen. And that's it. So 
I, I know it looks bad and I'm with you. I'd rather see everybody healthy if that's what you're asking. But well, no, I agree with everything that you just said. But I think the ignorance, Kenny, comes in the long term, what you can't quantify in terms right. of that damage. But yes, Josh Emmett, after this fight was completely clear of mind, his cardiovascular no, pace would have allowed him it. to fight a sixth round like he was livid that he didn't win the fight. And when he heard the 50 to 42, Kenny. You know, he got yeah. even more angry because he obviously thought the fight was more competitive. He did yeah. land a lot statistically. I don't know, Kenny, you come from a yeah. medical family. Maybe he's fine. But for me, like the visual ain't great. Yeah, it's not great. Um, And, and the thing is, he, he's been in some really tough fights. And, you know, can he still be a, a top guy at 145 pounds? Yes. Um, and again, what, what the hell does my opinion matter? But if he came to me and he said, Hey, Kenny, what do you think that would be? And if he was one of my fighters, I would say, Hey man, listen, um, uh, unless we're going to change your style completely and really add in some things and you know, you're, you're committed to it. But if you're fighting this way, can you be a top guy? Yes. Will you ever win the belts? And, and that's probably his goal. And I think it should be the goal of everyone who is fighting at a high level. Um, I would say it's time to retire. Why? Because, you know, here's the thing. Um, it, it, you could be that perfect matchup. And that is so tough, but not skilled enough. And if you are that dude that is very tough, but not skilled enough, you're most likely going to get a terrible beating. And then there's going to be another terrible beating against someone else. And what happens is, you know, organizations will will see that and they go, well, this is a tough guy. Here's a Tony Ferguson. Here's a Gaethje type guy. Yeah, Let me feed yeah. him to this up and comer. And what you end up becoming is a punching bag. Uh, and, you know, I, I think for some of these guys that have respect for themselves, that have been around the game for them, you know, for a long time, you don't want to be a punching bag. I mean, you look at I, I hate to use an example. Look at BJ Penn. Where you know, it's awesome because you're like, man, that's awesome. You still want to fight, yada, yada, yada. But man, this is not who you are at this stage of the game. The car needs a new engine. We need new tires. You got no brakes. You got these things. And you're hanging in there. You're tough. But you're continuing to take way too much damage. And it's at that point where you go, all right, it, it needs to stop. And, and it, it's tough because there's that very fine line between extremely tough and extremely stupid. And, and we've all played that game, unfortunately, as fighters, as competitors. We think we could do more, and no one needs to tell me what I'm doing, what, you know. And, and that's where, you know, you have to be really careful, I think. Yeah, so, I mean, right. I, think, Sometimes, I think it's a little ahead. early, John. I, I mean, I think it's I, – I get that. I'm, I'm not – Early for what? Anything. I didn't call for him to retire necessarily. No, no, no. I'm just saying that – Early for what? Know, I mean, if he's getting a decent payday and he could provide for his family and, you know, maybe – change some things around or mix it up. I, I think he needs another fight or two to, to see that. If he's going to keep fighting the top guys, these are the top, top guys. And what Kenny's saying is 100% true. I don't think he'll ever win the title at this point. That's that's out of the question. But, you know, I think there were guys that made a decent living that, you know, uh, never were the champion. And I don't know if he's in that position or not after he fought for the title or the interim title, but – I'd like to see the guy get paid really adequately because he is a performer. He does give the crowd what they want. Is there a downside to it? A hundred percent. But there's a downside to every fight. There just is. It, I mean, just logically there is, you know, unless the downside you get, of the radiation flying to Australia. Yeah, right. The downside. Uh, of I don't of know. It, you know. There's a hundred percent. So that's yeah. why I say if you're educated and you know what the downside is and you know what the upside is, you make the decision. I think that's what we're kind of, you know, founded on. We don't want to be told what to do, uh, but it's got to be an educated decision. And I would, I go either way. Uh, trust me. I'm not, I'm just saying like he fought two really top guys and you're right. He had the facial trauma, but you know, uh, I would, it, it depends on a couple of things for me, but uh, he's certainly still game. And for 38 years old, the guy's actually a monster. I think, I mean, he's, that's, you got to give it up to him for that. But uh, he get, he takes another beating like that, then I'm 100% on board. But I think there's a couple of guys he could get through and, you know, big, big kind of big fights and and see what happens from there. Yeah, I, I think it's a, I think it's a nuanced conversation, right? And, and it might yeah. be 
you have to shift your perspective and go, okay, yes, maybe, maybe I'm seeing this wrong. I'm, I'm no longer going to try to go for the belt. I'm yes. going to take, I'm going to take fights because I do get paid well, and I'm going to take yes. the right fights. If that's the case, okay, yeah. cool. Yes, that's great. That's what that's kind of um, what I'm saying. Know, like this, yeah, yeah, and, and that's yeah. that's definitely a different story. But you know, when you do look at it, you look at your fight career. Your fight career is like a small, minuscule percentage of your whole life. You know, 100%. and you have that small window and you want to maximize that window the most that you can. But at the same time, if you go too far, now it starts invading the other part of your life. That means being right. a dad, being a good husband, yes. being a good friend, being a brother. If you're not physically able to do those things that you used to do, that just like walking around doing regular dad stuff or regular husband stuff or regular human stuff, then you go, ah, maybe I did a little bit too much. So I it's that fine line of like, how much of that do I want to leave behind in my fight career? Right, and it's right. not always and an he, easy answer. And, and he's right there. He's at that point in his life where he's going to have to make a couple of hard decisions. But I, I, I that's kind of what I was saying. I still think yeah. there's fights for him. He could be entertaining yeah. and maybe get out of there and not take the beatings. Because these, these are... These are the elite of the elite. I don't think yeah. he's not. He's definitely not doing that. That's, you know, if he's one of those guys that's saying, I just want to keep fighting for the championship and he's his own worst enemy, that's different. But uh, it's the old, you know, change your way you look at things, the things you look at change. I think he's got to change his perspective, you know, be happy with making a couple of good paydays, provide for his family, and then take it from there. It's a nuanced conversation. It's it's one that we've had yeah. before. I recognize that guys towards the tail end of their careers, oftentimes they can make more money. You know, Ken Flo was never in the prize fighting business. I know his back played a role, but as soon as Kenny recognized that he couldn't be world champion, he was out of the game. Now, I respect yeah. Emmett for yes. sticking around. I'm never in the business of retiring fighters, right? I intended to have a totally different conversation on this, which centered around round four, right? And right. Josh Emmett's wife, Vanessa, and... Joey Rodriguez and Chris Holdsworth and Danny Castillo. Some of those guys are my friends, right? But I'm not afraid to open up this conversation. Does the end justify the means, right? Mm. Just because Josh Emmett lands a fucking significant strike that wobbles Toporia in round five doesn't necessarily mean that these coaches didn't fail the athlete. You know, you think Vanessa Emmett wants her husband to go back out there? I'm sure he's probably fine, right? Like facially and otherwise. Mentally, cerebrally, I think he's fine. Here's the definition of a 10-7 round, and apologize for my animated tone here, but like a 10-7 round at MMA is when a fighter completely overwhelms their opponent in effective striking and or grappling, and a stoppage is warranted. So if I'm Chris Lee, Kenny, right, I am completely convicted in writing down 10-7. Now, his, his might have been the minority opinion, right, when you poll this fan base, right? And I'm sure that a lot of people aren't going to be on my side of this, right? To me, though, I wouldn't have had a problem if one of those three coaches threw in the towel at the end of round four. And the other two judges had a 10-8, no real issue there. We see maybe one or two 10-7s a year. Emmett was on the right side of one against Felipe Aranches back in the day. Ken Flo, that round four is a 10-7 for me, and uh, I didn't need to see that round five. That, that was a tough one, and I agree with you. I, I think the corner could have done that um, because – it wasn't going to get if you're watching the fight and you're watching the flow of a fight, um, you know, you, you certainly want to believe in your fighter and, and give him that shot. But there was nothing that was going to change at that point. Luckily for him. Uh, and then, again, this is my interpretation of that fifth round was Ilya Topuria didn't want to go in on on Emmett anymore. And he basically just kind of laid back. That's why it wasn't as bad, I think. Like yeah, yeah, looking yeah, at the yeah, fifth yeah. round, you're like, that what, what do you mean? The fifth round, it was fine. He did okay. He was he was moving forward. He was back into Puri up. But I think that was more Topuri going, I'm not, I, I don't want to hurt you anymore, man. I, I honestly, yeah. I think it was him laying back and um not really wanting to do damage on a guy that he he just had his number, man. And that that's tough. That's tough. And Emmett, man, is such a stud. He again, well, you guys already yeah. mentioned it, but um, unbelievable fighter and and uh, tough as nails. Yeah, but John and, and the, the, we're in a, you, the the thing is, even if Emmett would have went out and knocked Tapuria out in the first minute, you're still holding to he shouldn't have been out for the fifth round. 
I am just opening up a conversation and leaning more towards that side of it, yeah. right? Like certainly this is not going to become a popular narrative because Emmett was competitive in that fifth round, you know, uh, but a 50 to 42, you know, you don't want to be on that side yeah, of it, yeah, 50 yeah. to 43 even. And uh, no, I guess I just would wonder aloud because uh, I'm not as close to Josh Emmett as I am to Kenny Florian. But if, if Ken Flo was on the wrong side of that, yeah. I'd be fucking texting Keith yeah. all night. Like, what are we doing here? You know? I'm serious. That's interesting. No, I love it. I actually love it. But um, yeah, it's really. Uh, and I've come know, to love Josh. You know, I'm curious. Yeah. Maybe his if, wife knows him much better than the rest of us. And he's totally yeah. fine. So I would say, like, if he didn't have big power, I would have stopped that fight in a heartbeat. Like, what was his like if he was just a grappler and he that was his only yeah. chance was to then it's a I just think he had the power and. Like, again, I think everybody knows what they're getting into. And yeah, it, it, that's yeah. a really t- it's just tough. You know, it's tough all around for everybody. The coaches, the fighter. Of course. Uh, but again, if his wife has that much influence over him, she's she should tell him to stop fighting and he should abide by it. Well, no, I'm and again, I'm really, truly not suggesting that he is at the end. I just think to Ken yeah. Flo's point, strategically find some matchups now. Yes, that maybe are uh, a touch more favorable, but uh, yes, That's the what UFC featherweight of. record books are going to reflect very fondly upon the body of work. Josh Emmett, right? Yes. 11 yep. knockdowns coming in at one point. Kenny, he had a stretch of seven straight fights in which he knocked somebody down. He fought for an interim championship, yep. right? Uh, a lot of accomplishments. And uh, yep. I just think we're in a tough reality sometimes where. And Josh Emmett, too, he's, he's in the NFT communities. Like, I think he does have uh, revenue streams beyond fighting. But I do think when you parlay the fact that guys make their biggest paydays oftentimes at the end of their career with the other part of it, that maybe there isn't a ton of things to do on the other side, it can be a recipe for disaster in terms of sustaining yeah. damage when you're uh, close to four. Yeah. And uh, that's all. Hey, Ray, and I, in terms of yeah. Elliot, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. Unfortunately, what you're saying is right, too. Those paydays come at a time in your career where you're not as good as you were three years ago either. It's just, a that's a weird, if I could correct one thing, that's what I would correct. Making sure these guys get paid so they don't have yeah. to do that. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. that's, that's really the problem. Now they're seeing decent sized paychecks. So of course they want to go in and get that. They like fighting and they don't look at the damage they're taking. They're never going to see the, the, the long-term effects because they're too focused right. on the prize in front of them. And that, that's a shame. And I, I agree. Yeah. I do agree with you hundred percent on everything. Ray, we are going to circle back to this UFC fight night when we get you out of here. But I do want to ask you a little bit about what, what was a crazy three days for you. So you cornered several different fighters across three days at three different venues. Is that what happened since we last spoke? Well, I did two days, Friday and Saturday. And then uh, Sunday, I just, I had to take I had, I had to take a little time because I mean the the, the other the fights on I had two girls fight on Friday night uh, both hard fought fights but they didn't go their way but we got out of the venue at like one in the morning I think Mia right. was fighting at like twelve thirty it was insane so then the next day I had to come in and then we had uh, me and Lou Neglia promoted a fight in Long Island and uh, Matt had two guys or really three guys they all won great fights. Uh, right. Shout out to Marcus, uh, Donnie, and um, Tommy. They just they did great. And then we had two winners uh, yesterday, uh, but that, that I didn't go to. Look, amateur kickboxers, uh, Georgie. Nice. Another Georgian guy. What a, again, sweetheart of a guy. He got a win, which I'm happy for, and a kid forehand who uh, got a win. So, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a hectic weekend, I will say that. All right, ma'am, before we let you go, of yes. all the other performers at that UFC fight night on ABC, I mean, Macy Barber, Shine, David Onama, Brendan Allen uh, looks Brendan like a guy Allen, I want to see fight the last style better like right now. I'll tell you what, Brendan Allen, I'm, I'm on the Brendan Allen bandwagon after that fight because he stayed in the pocket with a freaking killer and yeah. he took his shit. He came. I love those fights where you could take the best of what that guy has, but he can't deal with the shit you're good at. So what a great fight for Brendan Allen. I was... That was a really good fight, you know, for a couple of reasons. But uh, I'm on the Brendan Allen bandwagon. and I think he's going to pose a, a lot of problems for a lot of people. Well, we are uh, happy to hear that, and he will be very happy to hear that praise from Ray Longo, the uh, the Hall of Fame coach. Well, thank you, buddy. Uh, yeah. We appreciate the time. He's at Ray Longo MMA on Twitter, and uh, I think it's at Ray Longo MMA 9358. <laughs> if you like that Instagram, <laughs> ticket, maybe start posting. Maybe yeah, start again, posting. Don't- <laughs> yeah, I got to start. I got to get back in. I just can Zuckerberg. Can I get my fucking account back? How hard is that? The guy's not me. Are you freaking? How do you handicap? 
how do you handicap his fight with Elon Musk? Oh, that should be an entertaining fight. All right, dead air is great for the network. Okay, we'll talk to you next week, Ray. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's good. No, no, no. Obviously, he goes to the floor. Is that jujitsu goes a long way, man? Especially when a guy has nothing. It's a, right, yeah, Kenny. Yeah. I mean, it's a trust me. You put me on the floor with somebody who doesn't know anything. I'm going to look like a black belt. But, but yeah. so I, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's a, thanks for moving your schedule around for us today. Anytime, guys. It. Take it easy, man. Yeah, you, right. guys woke, man. you guys woke up. I'm happy because at the beginning oh, of this, woke. you almost put me to sleep. So that's what <laughs> we we save guys. our energy. Stay, right. I think you want us to go crazy in the pre-show. I want to go nuts right out bullets. of the gate. Yeah, crazy. All right. <laughs> All right, guys, take it easy. Enjoy. Right. Have a great day and a better evening. Great right. Longo with us every week here on the Anik and Florian podcast. Ilya Topuria is now 14-0, Kenny. He is 6-0 in the UFC. Anyone who wondered aloud how his style would translate over 25 minutes against an elite fighter, I think, got a lot of answers. I don't know that this guy uh, has many weaknesses that I've seen mentally, physically, emotionally. I think he has a great support system. As I mentioned, he deals with pressure well. What are your thoughts on the journey thus far for Ilya Topuria and Alexander Volkanovsky and Yair Rodriguez are going to fight in two weeks, right? So I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves in terms of handicapping Volkanovsky and Topuria, but because Volk is the consensus number one pound for pound fighter in the world, what are your thoughts on Topuria in that type of fight? And uh, do you think that indeed a championship opportunity is what's going to be next for the Spaniard? It's pretty simple. That son of a bitch is good. Uh, and, and I think yeah. you, it was great that you, you talked about all of those things because it's tough to see a fighter at this stage of their career to have all of those things. And I think that um, when you're looking at someone like Topuria from the outside looking in, you think, well, this guy is kind of, you know, this hot blooded dude. He, you know, he kind of talks a lot of trash and certainly he's not going to be patient when he fights. You're like, huh. Yeah, yeah, he's really fucking patient. And and then but he has that killer instinct as well and balancing those two things and balancing the emotions and you know, uh having that right mix of tactics and strategy but being aggressive. That's rare these days. That's rare and he's doing it at a very high level, John, and I think that he truly is one of those guys that could potentially again volkanovsky has been fighting a long time and you look at what volkanovsky has done he's not going to be easy to beat at this stage i would definitely have volkanovsky as a favorite against toporia but if there's one guy who has all those skills at this stage without the miles without the miles that can go out and beat volkanovsky it might it might be Ilya toporia dude like he i i, I really think he's that good um so i'm curious to see how when he takes his next fight because that's another thing john and i want to talk about he's had this like nice break of fights i think he had one quick turnaround but he's taking his fights and he's taking the right opponents at the right time that is another thing where management comes in and coaching comes in to make those right decisions and they're doing that too yeah so yeah well right if you're Ilya Topuria, right Brazilian jiu-jitsu, black belt, or otherwise. You take in a fight with a returning Brian Ortega in a main event in December, or you're going to buy your time and wait for a potential title fight at 14-0. and 0. You're right. Yeah. There's a strategy to all of this, and when I look at his UFC schedule here, right, October – of 2020 then he did have the quick turn december of 2020 but that was still a COVID climate fought just once in 2021 then twice in 2022 now he was to face mavsar Ivloyev at ufc 270 you may recall right. in january of 2022 Ooh. that's a type of interim title fight type deal right depending on if volkanovsky wins against yair maybe goes back up but mavsar withdrew he was replaced by charles jordan and then topuria was pulled due to a weight cutting issue that fight never happened i would love to see mavsar Ivloyev of an Ilya Topuria at some point in time. But I do believe that Topuria could have positioned himself already to just idle and wait for a title shot. But yeah, July 8th yeah. is coming quick. So Absolutely. And after seeing their last fight, and again, you never know what's happening going into the fight, but based on what I saw, that both of their last fights, I, I think Topuria, not only does he win that fight, I think I think Topuria might finish Ivloyev. To be honest, I, I don't I don't know if if Lo, if Loyev yeah. wants that smoke at this stage of the game. After what I just saw, that dude is uh, primed and ready. Yeah. I know Cody just said that uh, in the chat that Topodia could be back up for International Fight Week. Absolutely, unequivocally, no. Uh, he, I okay. love you, Cody, but he cuts a ton <laughs> of weight. And yeah. all he's talking about is eating and hanging out with his son. And it was also 25 minutes. He was hit pretty hard late in that fight. Uh, 
Yeah, I understand the testicles, Cody. I understand. <laughs> um, but he's absolutely not taking that fight uh, and not even weighing in for a couple hundred thousand dollars. That's the other thing, too, that you don't know sometimes how much financial freedom these individuals have, right? Yeah. Coming into the UFC, right? Like Adesanya could have come a lot earlier if he needed money desperately, right? There's a lot of different things going on. Like, I don't think Topuria is uh, as focused on the money as he is the world title. And, uh, you know, I had I don't think he has any problem uh, waiting a year right now, if, if need be. We also have a main event between Max Holloway and the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung. Max Holloway is the guy who I think Topuri has targeted in a non-championship situation. But again, couldn't have done more with a huge audience on ABC. We congratulate Ilya Topuri and Josh Emmett. Like all the respect, like buckets of respect oh, yeah. for the toughness and everything else. Can't even relate to any bit of it. Uh, but he is my friend. And man, sometimes it's hard to watch guys absorb a whole lot of damage. All right. Let us get to the co-main event. And Brian Petrie is going to join us for part of this recap coming up in about five minutes. Macy Barber over Amanda Hebos by TKO in round two. Some weird visuals from Amanda Hebos as they were about to announce the official decision. I don't know if she's just religious and into her faith as she was pointing to the sky. It was a finish, right? So certainly weren't waiting for any sort of scorecards, but that was a little bit alarming. Uh, But sound the alarm because Macy Barber looks a whole lot like a future champion to me, Ken Flo. It is crazy to think about her trajectory making her UFC debut at 20 years old. And now the sophistication of her striking, her feints, her in and outs to go with all the grappling, the mental fortitude. She's had a performance coach for years, like chips to the center of the fucking table on Macy Barber. Absolutely think she's going to fight for the world title. May just go out and win it. Dude, there, there's so much there. I, I do. I'm glad you reminded me about that at the end with he kind of pointing to the sky. I, I, I wasn't sure if she was like, you know, just thankful for God. And, you know, I know she's religious. Like if it was that or if she was like, please let me get this decision. And, and in my mind, I was like, does, does she know what does she know what's going on right now? Um, hopefully that that's not the case. Hopefully she's OK. But uh, anyway, uh, Macy Barber, man, what a performance. What a fight by both ladies. First of all, they went. At it, dude. Macy Barber was hitting Amanda Hebos like she stole something from her. And uh, I think that was the one of the best striking performances I've seen from Macy Barber. Because sometimes I feel like, you know, it's almost like she's shadow boxing and she's just kind of throwing punches wherever she was targeting and she was landing, you know. And, and uh, to me, you know, she's clearly a very strong girl. Um, I mean, she she is physically very impressive. Uh, I thought she had a, a very good performance. I thought she showed a lot of toughness as well, yeah. as well, because Amanda Hebus was landing some big shots, but the shots that Macy Barber was landing, like Amanda Hebus again coming up and wait, like she just wasn't ready for that level of power. And mm-hmm. Macy Barber took full advantage. What I loved about it on the ground was how she was like, "No, I'm not going to just like exchange jujitsu positions with you. I'm going to get to a position where I can beat you up. That's all I care about." Now, I thought that was a beautiful demonstration of MMA jujitsu or MMA grappling. Um, you know, sometimes we get too caught up as jujitsu guys, as grapplers mm-hmm. of like. Like going into grappling mode where it's like, no, you could still hover over them and rain down blows with good position. Like that is just as valid yeah. as, you know, exchanging or looking for submission. So I thought she just looked like she was finally comfortable in the UFC octagon. Like she's had good performances before, but this was one for Macy Barber that I thought she actually looked comfortable, like she belonged, like she was confident and she was executing her moves very well. Solid performance, man. Some suggesting that uh, Amanda Hebos did that same thing when she got knocked out by Marina Rodriguez. So uh, I guess not a big deal there. But Macy Barber's a big deal. And a lot of the copy that I wrote for this show ended up on the cutting room floor because we had a lot of decisions. But one of the things that I wrote about Macy Barber was that she definitely has a championship aura about her. One thing that uh, I think we benefit from, of course, are these fighter meetings. But having done them now for so many years with so many fighters, you gain a lot of intel uh, into sort of the mental and comparing one athlete to another. And uh, Macy Barber just has it. And she has five consecutive wins, Kenny, dating to the loss to Alexa Grasso, which was at UFC 258 in 2021. She said that was a brutal camp and she learned a lot. And look at the results since, right? Five straight wins. Now she gets the finish. She's going to be in the top 10, probably number eight or nine. Quick thoughts on Macy Barber moving forward. For me, it's probably a main event, right? It looks like a lot of the fighters near the top of the division 
do have fights right now, but I think you could do worse than like a, a Macy Barber, Caitlin Chukagian main event. You know, what are your thoughts on Macy Barber? And uh, realistically, in your mind, how high is the ceiling? You know, I, I think the ceiling is very high. I was a little uh, doubtful of that um, at some points of her career, but I think seeing that last performance against Hebos, um, I, I, I came away very impressed. I think she could absolutely climb her way to the top and, and fight for the belt at some point. I think taking the right fights would be crucial. I think maybe someone like a, uh, you know, not going too high, but getting that experience, right? Lauren Murphy, I think, for example, would be a good uh, good yeah. fight. Jennifer yeah. Maya, you know, um, yeah, what, what one of those uh, I think makes a lot of sense. And I think getting that experience and now you know with now that she has that confidence and those skills in place i think is going to be crucial for not only getting to the top but having that lasting power where you could you know that where you could stay there for for right, a long time right. i think that's that's just as important for a young fighter as well and those are good options and those are all tough fights i guess i would just like to see her elevated into a main event seems like women headline a lot i would like to see macy barber afforded that opportunity couple poll questions today at anna florian pot on twitter poll question number two i always go radio mode on the poll question you know like like <laughs> like artificial radio voice poll question <laughs> for today's anna and florian podcast after her incredible showing on abc this past weekend how do you foresee the future for 25 year old macy barber will she become a ufc champion right so your options are world champion fights for the title but no belt or gets to a main event but no title shot and right now 26.5 percent of fans poll believe she will become a world champion 54.1 percent think she'll fight for the title but not win the belt and then uh about 20% of you think main event, but no title shot. The other poll question, Ken Flo. And I don't know if you saw the fight, the prelim between Chepe Matascal and Trevor Peak. You probably didn't see it. I right? did not. All dude. Right. So yeah. your homework for next week's Anakin Florian podcast is to go watch Chepe Matascal. The only reason I didn't book him today is because I know how busy you have been. Like we've gone 45 minutes today. We haven't even talked about the PFL. But go look up Chepe Matascal and the poll cool. question. At Anna Florian Pod, should Chepe Matascal go high and tight and get a skin fade or keep the whiffle? 62.0. The numbers have changed. It's not that high. A lot of you guys <laughs> like the whiffle. But earlier today, almost 63% of you thought that uh, he should get a skin fade. But, dude, that's one of the best fights of 2023 for me. Damn. And Damn. Just an incredible UFC debut by a guy competing against an undefeated fighter up a division. Uh, a lot to unpack on that. Gotta check Real it quickly out. wanted to uh, touch on the heavyweights, Austin Lane and Justin Taffa before we bring on Brian Petrie. Like my daughter, we were wrestling and poked me in the eye after that fight. And I'm so glad it happened. Right. Cause yeah, like I'm a pussy, whatever. Right. But like, Ow. And I couldn't see <laughs> for a little bit. So, like, respect to Bilal Muhammad, who absorbed a brutal one back in the day against Leon Edwards. Respect to Justin Taffa. Like, I can assure you, the last thing he wanted was to make less money and have that entire flight back as a one-eyed yeah. fighter. Like, I don't know. I thought Dan Mergliata did him a little bit of a disservice, if I'm being honest. Like, I just thought that the trigger could have come sooner. I didn't know what we were waiting for. I was observing Mark Goddard's body language. He was trying to expedite the pro process as best he could from his vantage point. Like, dude, bat like half of Austin Lane's finger through the knuckle in the mid joint was in Justin Taffa's eye. Yeah, and he's six foot, what, six foot seven or something like that, six, yeah, six or yeah. whatever. That's right. a big finger, dude. Uh, it was horrible. It was horrible. I thank my lucky stars that I never took an, an eye gouge like that during that point in my career. Like, I would have been so upset. First of all, because that fight is taken away, right? Um, and potentially permanent damage to the eye. Right. It's like you lose one of the eyes or you lose some kind of vision or have some issues with your eye. You could never fight again. So and again, um, you know, Austin Lane wasn't trying to do that on purpose. It was just a, a weird occurrence. Yeah. Uh, unfortunate. But, yeah, you hate seeing those type of occurrences. And um, it, it doesn't take a whole lot, as as you were talking about, to to mess up your eye. I think the worst thing I had, I got like maybe a side of a glove in the eye. I got blood in my eye twice. And that becomes like someone puts like a red curtain over your eye and you just can't see anything. So I I've dealt with like not being able to see uh, during a fight, but I've never dealt with like a finger in your eye. Yeah. You know, that, that that's just a whole different ball of wax. And um, that sucks. That That's never a good thing. And I, I just hope his eye is okay. He's able to well, fight. Right. You know, odds are yes, but maybe not. 
maybe that's not. the rub exactly yeah. right. And maybe I shouldn't come down on the referee. Maybe I'm looking for more conviction from the doctor because you can be sure some of our ringside physicians in Nevada are stopping that thing the fifth time Justin Taffa says he can't yeah, see. And I'm pretty close to the guy, right? I can see how bad the damage is. Like, have we learned nothing from Michael Bisbee, right? When it comes to the eye and the fact that he fought George St. Pierre and Kelvin Gastelum with one eye and probably several other individuals as well. Yes. I don't know, man. I don't know. It just seemed like that went on way too long than it should have. And I just hope people cut Taffa a break. Certainly anticlimactic for Austin Lane with that Jacksonville backdrop, but it is what it is. These guys get an eye poke like that. You got to stop the fight. Uh, All right, I'm going to go three wide now and welcome in big gun Brian Petrie into the conversation. It was a big week for him. More on that later when we get to the main event challenge. But uh, just in terms of a few things, BP, and it's good to see you, buddy. Hey, what's up, boys? I told Ah. my personal trainer, Rio Santana, at the Institute of Human Performance that you were 6'3", and he was like, what? I'm like, dude, I'm telling you. (laughs) I'm bigger than people people box too. I got, I got the baby face. I'm bigger than people think I'm a thick old boy. I just got thick parts. That's all it is. (laughs) By the way, uh, where's Kenny at? Who's this 22 year old guy with no fish? We're doing the show. Who's this handsome guy. What's going on? I don't really like the no beard, but I think you look, I think you look good both ways, but that's what (laughs) I'm saying. Thank you, dude. He's making me feel good after, after the week he destroyed, absolutely (laughs) destroyed me. I'm down on the ground. Mountain, just <laughs> shots. Just uh, sorry. All right. Oh yeah, we're gonna get into all of that. What's most interesting about that? Respectfully, like I no. had no idea until I tally the standings, right? And maybe I could have a better memory or listen better. I listen to every goddamn word you guys have to say, but I don't know when I'm calling these fights what's exactly right. going on. Maybe I should just bring the card with me when I have a commercial <laughs> break or something. But, um, you know, we have a family atmosphere here on the Anakin Florian podcast, so I waited to bring up my kids in the arena until this segment. I know Petrie, as a father of young children, was touched by the UFC sort of taking care of my kids, but I have mm-hmm. to tell you guys. So, because it was a matinee, it was the perfect storm. VIP arena area wasn't particularly crowded, right? But circumstantially, Bri, my kids left after round three of that main event. And certainly really? they saw a bloody co-main event. And my yeah. kids don't care about the blood. They had the time right. of their lives to Amber and everybody else. Like, I don't even know how to repay you people for the experience you gave my family and the memory that we will now have forever. But what are the odds that they would walk out after round three before the 10 seven? Right, you know, thank right, God. Right. Like that could have really had an effect, I would think, on my daughters. Like that dude took a pounding in round <laughs> yeah, four. Right. That's nuts, dude. It's touching. I'm such a softy now with, 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 the, with the two girls and seeing your wife post that stuff about your son because I knew it was his birthday. Happy birthday, Hunter. And then seeing him be that close to you. Oh man, it it pulled on my heartstrings, man. That's cool. It was, it was I believe it was, it was. Two of your three kids' first shows. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just that's just unbelievable, man. That's really cool. All right. So on my list for you today, Chepe Matascal and Trevor Peak, but firstly on the main event. And we did a deep dive on the Josh Emmett side, but a 10-7 round in MMA is when a fighter completely overwhelms their opponent and effective striking and or grappling and a stoppage is warranted. Uh, Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts on that part of the fight, that huge fourth round for Topuria, and uh, I guess everything that happened between rounds and thereafter. Yeah, I, I had no problem with the 10-7. I mean, listen, Toporio, every time he hit Emmett, it hurt him. I mean, if there's a 10-7 MMA, that's got to be it. You know what I mean? So I have no problem with that at all. And usually I'm such, I'm a guy that's like throwing the towel, right? You know, his face is a mess. Every time it was a thud to the head, you're like, oh, but he, Emmett's power keeps him in a situation like that because you can't pull the rug from him because we've seen in the Michael Johnson fight. So it almost like it hurts him because he's going out there in the fifth round winging shots and one of those can land. You know what I mean? Like what if one of those lands and we're then we're we're talking about this great comeback by Josh Emmett. Um, So it it, it was it was not hard for me to watch. Actually, uh, usually it is. I just appreciated Emmett's heart when the doctor asked him, like, do you want to continue? He's like, fuck yeah. Like right, that, right. I mean, that's some G shit right there. And then Taporia showing, answering all the questions that I had about him. And I know we were kind of active in the group chat, his patience, his vision in the pocket, Chris Curtis, who's not complimentary, nor does he watch MMA huh. complimented Alir Taporia's defense, which says something, right? That that's a guy who's paying attention uh, to someone really good uh, defensive like that. Um, I love the main event, man. I think we have a star in the making 
to pour a good looking guy, you know, you know, speaks English. Well, speaks Spanish has not a lot of people come from Spain either. I know he's Georgian, but he's got the Spain. He's yeah. there with a the hot chick walking on the octagon. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's flashing on uh, Bentley's on Instagram. Like this dude yeah. could be a star for sure. And, and, and I'm glad you touched on his management because his management coaching, whatever, they're really putting him in positions to shine here. And, and that's, that's really important. So, and he's got the entourage, the entourage behind entourage. him all week. Yeah. Yeah. Not like some of the, the Irish fighters or the Georgian fighters. There's right. a definite uh, vibe when it's team Topodia in town and uh, they masterfully handled their first UFC main event and uh, all that came with it. All right. So Chepe Matascal and Trevor peak. It's yeah. one of the best fights I've called in 2023. I'm so excited to talk to Chepe Matascal in the future here on the Anakin Florian podcast. But I guess I'll ask you this because it did not win fight of the night. That went to Ilya yeah. Topodia and Josh Hammett. And oftentimes the preliminary fighters, uh, don't get that type of nod or treatment because of everything that happens thereafter. But let me ask you this. Yeah. This is the question that I formatted for the show today. How do you compare at year's end a fight between Jared Cannonier and Marvin Vittori right. at the UFC apex versus Chepe Matascal and Trevor peak with a crowd. It wasn't like packed to the nines at that point mm-hmm. of the night, but in terms of those two fights in back to back weeks and the yeah. fight of the year conversation, how do those stack up in your mind? So I'm a bit of a MMA snob, uh, as they would say. The the Trevor Peak Masquerade fight was great, but it did get a little kind of backyardy, brawly. Peak with his hand on the cage, gassing and then throwing haymakers. Like that's really fun. You need fights like that. Both those guys are absolute dogs. But for me, being a snob, I'm glad I don't get a vote. I prefer a little more technique, a little more, you know, like that's like a Leonard Garcia type of fight. You know, back in the day, everyone. Those are cool. Those are great. I enjoyed the shit out of that. I was at my daughter's birthday party watching on my phone going nuts. Like, look at this dude from Alabama yeah, just yeah. swinging, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, fight of the night, sure. I mean, listen, Taporia Emmett was a more high level fight, more stakes. I don't know how that factor in. Hopefully, those guys got some kind of bonus because Chepe looked, I mean, he's fought some really good guys outside the UFC. That's Ban Hattie yeah. camping my part. I picked Peak just because he's kind of a little MMA Twitter. Marvel right now. I mean, the guy yeah. clearly cuts his own hair. He, I don't know where he trains at in Alabama, right? But he's just swinging. And Chepe has a decent little record. He went in there and performed really well. Uh, but yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't be on my top five, Johnny, a, a five of the year. If I'm being honest with you, I don't know that either one of them is going to end up in my top five. I just think it's an interesting oh, okay. conversation. Beauty gotcha. in the eye of the beholder. Uh, yeah. I like this one better than Vittori Cannonier. Gotcha. I think you're shortchanging Chepe Matascala Skosh, right? Okay. Like. Fair Cody's enough. writing in the chat. Trevor Peak always gets backyardy, and I agree with that. The downward yep. hammer fist. I can't wait for Kenny to watch it next <laughs> week. But Chepe Matascal, man, for a UFC debut, right? Up mm-hmm. 10 pounds at lightweight. And the strength of schedule, Kemflo, by the way, coming in. Yeah. He's the first guy to beat Yusuf Zalal, took his yeah. O, beat Pat Sabatini, fought Bryce Mitchell in 2017, fought Gregor Gillespie in 16, Sean Soriano, Steve Garcia in an LFA main event in 2020. Like, this dude deserved to be here. He's been mm-hmm. helping Justin Gaethje with his defense, with his sparring. Chepe Mariscal, man. Chepe fucking Matascal. Like, I'm so excited yeah. to see the future. He's got a significant other, Claire Guthrie, chief in the corner. Let's go, Chepe. <laughs> dude, I, so I, I got to say, I, I got to defend myself here a little bit because people get upset. They're like, dude, does Please Florian, do. watch, these, do. Does Florian do. watch these fights or what? And I'm like, on a PFL fight week, like, and it's three in a row, it's very no. difficult for me, yeah. guys. I'm sorry. I got to watch twice as many fights as everybody else. I got to I gotta get there. I have a family as well, guys. I mm-hmm. do other stuff as right. well. It's really tough. So I, if I miss a fight and I'm not speaking intelligently about it, I am so sorry. But it's not because I <laughs> don't want to, okay? No, All some right. weeks absolutely are, are no. tougher than others, to be Can't sure. Can't watch every certainly- three months. Don't bring that up to to throw you under the bus at all. All he's required to watch is the main card for us, and uh, we're required to watch the main card of the PFL, and we will get to PFL 6. I might have to shortchange these UFC Fight Night predictions just a little bit, boys, because there were so many other things that we need to get to here from this this main card on ABC. Like Ray Longo touched on Brendan Allen, Kenny, Mm -hmm. but... Brendan Allen has arrived at 185 pounds and uh, had a willing dance partner in Bruno Silva who provides a tremendously high danger factor. But Brendan Allen wants to fight the toughest guys. And even though maybe he turned this fight down initially, he understood the value of a win over Bruno Silva and uh, gets him out of there. Ken Flo on ABC. And I agree with Brendan Allen in terms of what he said after the fight. Like he presents a threat to Adesanya in myriad areas the way a lot of these top 85ers who've had a shot don't. 
He's turned a corner, man. You know, I, 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 I think he's in a good spot because of where he's placed in that division and the fact that Adesanya has beaten everybody in that division. Um, he's got a shot at some point, right? I, I think that was smart for him to do that. He has turned a corner, no question in my mind, because there's times where, like, he will use, he will lead with his heart and his toughness, and he'll find a way to win. This was his skill leading the way. I think obviously he did get hit with a certain shot. His toughness was there, but he was so calm on the counter. And when he finished, it was like, I don't know. He it looked like that student teacher relationship when he got the finish. He was like, nah, son, went back, had his space, knocked him out, watched the whole thing happen, watched like the the punch whiz by him, and he just took care of business. It was sweet. And I think he's really coming into his own. That was a great fight for him to build yet even more experience and confidence and momentum. And uh, I'm excited for him because he's also just a great kid. So good to see Mm -hmm. him do well, man. BP, you got anything for me uh, on Mr. Brendan Allen over Bruno Silva by Rear Naked Show? Yeah, a guy keeps taking my money. I keep stupidly fading him. Listen, I, the one thing that really shined in this fight is the two fights that he had lost with, with Strickland and, and, and Chris. He got hit, and then it was a panic that set in and then that led to the finish. He got cracked by one of the hardest hitters at 85. Definitely wobbled. Definitely legs went numb. Bells ringing. And he stayed composed, right? He said, I've been here before. Let's not freak out. High guard. Circle, circle. And then he can start countering, right? He didn't just start firing off and get clipped again. I love seeing that from him. Not to mention, he's like 27 years old. He's yeah. starting to round in. I still cool. like to see him go against like a Jarrett Cannoneer. Yeah. Uh, uh, something like that. I know that he kind of called for that fight as well. Um, but if they throw him in with Izzy, Izzy's kind of lapping the vision. I'm not going to complain about it. Take my money. I'll watch that, right? You no, know? I think you set that up well. I yeah. think a main event against Jared Cannonier that he called for makes a ton of sense. Yeah. I think you got to get him the purple shorts. I think you got to get him the yeah, show in give Louisiana. Him the purple shorts. His brother James Jr. is a quadriplegic, and I don't know how far he can travel, but that is part of the impetus for uh, – for a show in Louisiana. By the way, remember when we had Brendan Allen on the Anakin Florian podcast and I was like, yeah, your wife and your daughters. He's like, oh, actually, I'm not married. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> oh, shit. It's <laughs> <laughs> good timing. That was good. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations <laughs> also to David Onama. Nice hit for Pichu there on him. Plus 195. Camp change paying immediate dividends for him as he cashes as an underdog. Neil Magny over Phil Rowe. Randy Brown makes it five wins in his last six. Tabitha Ricci, Baby Shark a fourth consecutive win. And uh, Jack Jenkins also a nice win over Jamal Emmers, although I think a lot of people inside that arena felt like that fight should have gone the other way. Actually, yeah, one of the judges had a 30 to 27 for uh, for Mr. Jamal Emmers. Oof. All right, we are going to spin it forward. But before we do that, I'm going to take up 120 seconds of Kenny Florian's time, if I could, and talk about PFL 6. And sure. Shane Burgos makes $100,000 to show he gets his first win, but he is out of the tournament. Sada C, though, man, is the guy whose Wikipedia page that I printed up today because Ken Flo, like – when did you make your PFL debut as a commentator? Like, do you have that information for me? Yeah, no, I see. I, 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 isn't I, that I, hard? I, like, why am I asking you that? Was it 2021, right? Because this dude was 9-6-2 and two after a loss to Magomed, Magomed Karamov at PFL 7. And now it's just like green stripes everywhere. The bodies yeah. are hitting the fucking floor. His name's Sadabu fucking C. And even though he's closer to 40 than 30, I'm all in. So yeah. tell me about what happened there in the ATL. Dude, he's a beast, man. The way he's put it all together, you know, sometimes it takes a little while for you to get it together, get your game together. And he has been working, you know, very hard on his wrestling. And I think finally, now that his wrestling is coming to order, he showed that last year. Uh, and now, now he can actually let his hands fly. Last year, he wasn't as confident letting his hands fly. But now it's coming all together. The confidence, the wrestling, the striking. And dude, he put on a show. Like he was looking for this spinning wheel kick three times, maybe four times, and finally got it at the end. And dude, he throws it so damn fast and how he was like disguising it with all these other things. It's, it's really impressive. Six foot three, 170 pounds, you know, world-class striker now has the, the wrestling to keep it on the feet. Really? He doesn't have easy matchups. You know, you have these two Russians on the other side, Umulatov and Magomed Karimov, but um, yeah, man, he, he really is developing into uh must see TV. 
According to Tapology, Ken Flo's first PFL broadcast was April 23rd, 2021. So I think Sadabusi really just needed Ken Flo on the sticks and uh, yeah. that has led to his Good success. Luck. Hey, yeah. Bri, yeah. you know, my schedule is, is you know, tighter than five virgins in a Volkswagen, as the rapper mm-hmm. Matt Skills would say, right? So I don't mm-hmm. ingest every PFL broadcast, but... Is that capable for the? Is that okay I'm, for the DraftKings Network? Is that okay? yeah. <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah, you're the well, I don't watch every PFL broadcast, but to sure. me, what Sadabusi did is one of the best knockouts I've seen in 2023. Is that not like a knockout of the year candidate, BP? For sure, hundred percent, and especially right. that he called his shot too, right? I mean, that's such a great technique, and he called it. He's like, I want to go viral. He started to get confident, like Kenny said. I watched this guy in his PFL debut. Uh, since he started in the PFL and I'm like, man, he's so afraid of the takedowns. He can't let his striking go. Cause he's so sick on the striking. Then he stops the takedowns and he's like, okay, let's get flowy. Let, Cause he's got so many weapons on the feet. And he's really fun to watch. He's someone really easy to root for as well. Such a sick knockout. Definitely top five candidate of the year and just right. an overall performance as well. I mean, he was, he was on point that night. It was awesome. Yeah, BP, thank you. I buried the lead. He called that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He said, yeah. I want a viral knockout for this one. And he goes out and does it. I mean, that's yeah. not easy to do. And my guy, Clay Collard, right? Getting it done over Stevie Ray by TKO. 31 Gs to show, another 31,000 to win. So happy to see Clay Collard continue to realize success. Stevie Ray's a good egg, too. I enjoyed covering his UFC career. And Olivier Obama Mercier, Ken Flo, perhaps... The biggest success story in terms of UFC guys coming to the PFL. I mean, obviously, there are millionaires like Sean O'Connell out there, but uh, OAM, man, I mean, just continues to evolve and uh, a huge knockout with that knee over Anthony Romero. Just continues to get better and better, man. And now he's blending the aggression and the killer instinct with his tactics and strategy now. And, and it's great to see. He's, uh, he's a beast. First of all, just as big as a welterweight, and the way he puts it all together and how he gets you to fight his fight is unlike anything I've seen in a long time. Just, uh, you know, as far as using his overall skill set, it's uh, he's high level, man. He's fighting at extremely high level right now. And it's great to see him get finishes as well. All right. Big weekend for the PFL and also the UFC. I'm trying to think, like, do I go Chepe Matascal Wiffle tattoo on my chest if he wins the world title? I don't think <laughs> I don't think I want that tattoo. But Chepe, oh, if you're watching, if you get that skin fade, man, I might get your face tattooed on my body if you win the title. <laughs> Kenny, I do think later tonight you're going to have to watch Chepe Matascal. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, I'm watching. I'm watching. Dude. <laughs> and I will say, too, you know, like his mom died on his birthday last year. Oh, and man. I know I a quick turn there, but I just want to bring yeah. it up because I was going to try to book Chepe this week. Uh, but when we moved the show up to Monday, I drove back from Walt Disney World today because one of my kids got really sick. I didn't have time to book him, but his mom died on his birthday last year. And there was a time where a lot of people in Chepe's inner circle wanted him to get out of fighting. Mm. And we talked about the strength of schedule, a lot of early career losses to elite guys. And his mom was always like, you can't quit now. You've come this wow. far. Like, you got to stay wow. with it. And uh, that's awesome. Look we'll at Chepe Matascal right now. Love it. All right. We do have a pronunciation of the week before we get into the main event <laughs> challenge, Bri. And I know <laughs> oh. you're going to love the updated standings when we get there. Yeah. So don't worry yeah, too yeah, much no, we're about good. the pronunciation of the week. But this fighter will welcome Kevin Lee back to the UFC this weekend. He's won 19 in a row. He's 20 and 1 overall and 2 and 0 in the UFC with wins over Andreas Mikhailidis and Brian Battle. He is a welterweight competing live on ESPN in the featured prelim against Kevin Lee this weekend. Brian Petrie, of whom am I speaking? I never plug my own show because John does such a wonderful job doing that. But if you want to see me butcher every name on the card besides oh. Kevin Lee, hop over to MMA Takes Podcast on YouTube. We're trying to get to 1,400. Anyway, the guy you were talking about, and I got to get out of my head because the first name's throwing me off. We're going to go Renat Fakhradinov. Let's hear how he says it. Hi, my name is Renat Gladiator Fakhradinov. My name, Renat Gladiator Fakhreddinov. Very close. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it was close. really it close. Was close. The first name threw me off because I want. I initially want to go Re or Rynod or whatever because the I. Yeah. And then I go, no, reverse brain it, left brain, right brain, whatever. Yeah. And yeah, we got close. We got close. Yeah. Close, not good enough. Incidentally, Brian no, Petrie no, falls no. to 0-2 on to the me. pronunciation <laughs> of the week. But you did nail Fakhradinov, and I did have to good. play that file for my daughter today because he really hits that fuck, right? It's like yeah. it's fuck. It's not F-U-C-K, but Fakhradinov, Renat, take it on Kevin Lee this weekend. And that'll be the first fight we pick, but not before we update 
Let's do it. I need it. I need it. Let's go. And Brian uh, Petrie and I may not be cracking empty beer bottles ooh, really? over our heads at year's end when all is said and done. Our fearless leader, Kenny Florian, came in minus $20 on the year. It's a tough luck one in five on the day. That included a three-unit stinger on Amanda Hebos. So it's a minus $930 week. Kenny now minus oh. $950 on the uh. year. Brian Petrie started the week minus twenty seven hundred and eighty dollars. Mm-hmm. He had his biggest week of the year, seven and one. That included underdog hits on David Onama and Macy Barber, a Don't. five unit whack on Ilya Topuria, uh. and an additional underdog play on Jack Jenkins at plus one forty against uh. Jamal Emmers. Six picks for Ken Flo versus eight for Petrie because Ken Flo abstained on Brendan Allen versus Bruno Silva, and Kenny did not give out an additional prelim pick. So Brian Petrie, the floor is yours. Congratulations on a seven and one week. We got a ball game. Yes. I listen. I I know better than anyone. There's highs and lows in this game. I could go one and seven next week. I'm not going to trash talk Kenny. I've seen him elbow people in the face. I don't want that to happen. Okay. But it was a good week. I had a good week into my personal bank account as well. Uh, a loyal guy who follows this show and other shows won 10 K on a, a parlay and he, nice. and he and he spread it the love your boy's way. So that was generous. Didn't expect that. Try to give it back to him. He refused. But uh, yeah, it, overall, it's a good week. You know, it's a good week and I'm feeling pretty good. I'm sitting tall, boys. I'm sitting so what, tall. Today. What are the numbers right now? Did, well, right. So the one thing I failed to do, and we had a crazy night, right? I had a kid just puking all night. So I've been up <laughs> since like three o'clock in the morning oh, and man. then drove Oof. three hours. I'm full of excuses today. Maybe why I kind of went a little bit hard in the paint on Longo earlier. In the show. <laughs> I'm losing to the listenership one show at a time. So but no, for Brian Petrie, I had you and I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, plus yeah. 1175 on the week. Sounds about right. Yeah. Sounds so, about right, Johnny. I mean, that's so what very significant. So it's he like- is minus 1605 and we got a whole new ball game. And Damn. Kenny's minus nine fifty. Okay, well, we can play with that. I'm just trying we to can play with that. We can play All with right. that. <laughs> things have gotten so much more interesting. I know yeah. the folks at the DraftKings Network are very excited that things have tightened up. So let us yeah. spin things forward. It is UFC Fight Night, Strickland versus Magomedov live from the UFC Apex this weekend, and we will begin in that welterweight division with Renat Fakhradinov minus two hundred five against Kevin Lee plus one seventy five. So, Brian Kevin Lee back in the big show after that just one fight with Eagle FC in which he beat Diego Sanchez. That was March eleventh of two thousand twenty two. It was at one hundred and sixty five pounds. He had lost four of five in the UFC mm-hmm. before that departure. Now he's back. Your thoughts? Interesting that he kind of to me a guy who follows everything slid on the radar signing with the UFC right this is a guy who main evented this guy who fought Tony Ferguson for the interim and he's now kind of placed weirdly on this card not you know not a lot of people talking about it which is interesting because uh, the guy's a star in my opinion I love me some Kevin Lee. Biggest problem with Kevin Lee in my, he's still young, but the biggest problem was in the day was a little bit of cardio issues, a little bit of arrogant issues. I think maybe some out, out of the cage issues, whatever. It looks like he's fixing it up. I mean, he fought in Eagle FC with like a blown out knee. The guy's got toughness. The guy got heart. The guy stepped in potholes in many fights. I mean, remember the spinning wheel kick on Barboza? I mean, this guy's got a ton of heart. And I looked at his stats and not a lot of people can out grapple this guy. They just can't. Uh, Rafael Dos Anjos landed at four takedowns on him, but he landed at six. I know he got submitted in that fight, but Everything I've heard about Kevin Lee is he's such a stud in the gym. He's so good good in the gym. They got Fakhardin off here who came in and just butchered Brian Battle. Didn't get a finish. Brian Battle's still a little young in the tooth. And if you look at Fakhardin's record leading into the UFC, he's looked dominant, but against so-so competition, some Eastern European guys that are, you know, who knows what they're doing now. Kevin Lee's fought the best of the best. Has he lost? Yes. Has he main evented? Yes. Plus 175 against a guy who I think Fakhradinov's not going to take Kevin Lee down. I think he's going to throw big shots. I think Kevin Lee's going to get back to his kicking game, get back to his hands. He can throw a lot of volume. People are forgetting that he slept Gregory Lepsey, one of the best head kick knockouts we've all have ever seen. Give me Kevin Lee at the dog price. He's going to reintroduce himself to the UFC fans this weekend, I think. I think a lot of money is going to be on Fokker Dinoff. He is a guy you know that people are looking at, but uh, give me Kevin Lee as his dog here. I like that. And me and you are going to sleep Ken Flo and Cody Merrill with beer bottles that are empty when they lose this main event challenge <laughs> if you keep swinging them the way you did last week. Uh, oh, Ken yeah, Flo, yeah, Kevin yeah. Lee still just 30 years of age, plus 175 here. Had the Charles wow. Oliveira fight right before COVID, obviously. Then the Daniel Rodriguez fight. I think there was an Adderall issue there. Uh, 
then the fight with Diego Sanchez, and now he's back against Fakhradinov. Granted, hasn't fought the schedule, but 19 in a row in modern-day mm-hmm. MMA is uh, not nothing. Right. Hey, listen, may- maybe my confidence is low. Maybe I'm, I'm trying not to let my hands go, but, uh, you know, like just worried about the takedown here. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I like uh, I like fuck Radinoff here. Okay. I, okay. I really do. And I, listen, I think he actually is going to take it down. Kevin Lee, I, I think trying to defend takedowns against uh, Renat is going to be very difficult up against the cage. Um, I think Kevin. Um, I, I think needs to get going offensively. If he's able to do that, get his striking, and keep Renat on the outside. I, I think, yeah, he could definitely win that fight. I think there's uh, absolute value there. Uh, but just watching Fakhradinov, that, that, I hate it because everybody always makes the same comparison. There's definitely a lot, definitely a lot of Habib Nurmagomedov vibes mm-hmm. yeah. uh, on his end. The way that he sets up his uh, his takedowns, uh, you know, he's just good enough. To, to get you in on your legs. He's so good. Once he gets top control, you get back to your feet. He pulls you right back down to the mat again. He's just a nuisance on, on the yeah, ground. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that he'll be able to stay out of trouble when it comes to the striking game, get enough respect uh, from Kevin Lee on the feet, get in on those legs. And if he gets Kevin Lee down just once, okay, maybe twice, I think he could finish this fight. Kevin is oh, not wow. known for his ground game on bottom. Mm-hmm. I think he's good if he gets on top, but on bottom, I think, is where Kevin is going to struggle, especially against a, a control monster like Fakhradinov. So, uh, yeah, give me Rinat. Nice. Why did you shave your beard? That is probably as short as it's been in the eight-year history of the show. What led to the decision to uh, you know, shave the beard and not after, just trim it? After a while, you know, I just kind of, like, make sure that my face is, like, staying clean. So, yeah, I'll, like, sure. I'll, like, scrub it down. Yeah. You know, like, get it all. You know, I'm just a... Yeah, it Fresh just start. Yeah. yeah, it gets itchy every once in a while. So I'm like, I'm yeah. gonna shave it and just kind of reset. Maybe get some sun out there. We'll see. Nice. Yeah. yeah. DC's I look like assistant, a clown, though. Daniel Cormier's assistant, Cassandra Clark, uh, oftentimes will text me on a Monday. We do the show, like, oh, clean shave, and it's like, dude, I'll have a full beard by Friday. You'll see. <laughs> I know. Uh, my back and everywhere else. Uh. <laughs> All right, let us move on to the main card opener at middleweight. Good time to remind you, it's Bruno Fajeda, right, Ken Flo? Because we got the two R's versus yes, Alex Pereira with just Nailed one. It. So Bruno Fajeda minus one sixty five. Abdul Razak Al Hassan is plus 140. Fajeda had a memorable UFC debut, largely why we're picking this fight today. Knocked out Gregory Rodriguez at UFC 283, Brian. That was back in yep. Rio in January. He's 10 as a pro. Came off season six of the Contender Series. Now we see what he has for Al Hassan, who has found a better form than he had a mm-hmm. couple of years ago. What are your thoughts on this one at 85, kid? Just a banger. Bang city, uh-huh. bang time. Bruno Ferreira is a guy I hit a big underdog with early this year when he knocked out Robocop. You know, there was a fight he was losing, knocked him out in the first round. Right. This guy knocks people out in the first round. What does he look like in the second round? What does he look like in the third round? I don't know. Al Hassan is usually pretty sturdy. I mean, Chaos Williams got him, but he's also got big power and he's got a judo game to him as well. And he kind of can mix it up. There's a lot more questions with Bruno than Al Hassan. So I'm going to take Al Hassan. I like him by finish probably in the second or third round. Maybe as this fight gets extended, Bruno can prove me wrong. Be a one hit wonder, be a one round knockout guy his whole career. But I think if he gets extended, this could get interesting because we just haven't seen it yet. You know, let, let's see what this kid's got. I'm willing to go on Hassan here uh, to make sure We'll see what uh, Ferreira's got. And the one thing about our main event challenge that is tricky with you guys picking a lot of these fights is that you really pay the price on favorites, you know? Like, yeah. I don't know. There, I, I feel like if I was involved, I would be incentivized heavily to pick underdogs because you're only Dogs. losing 100 bucks. whereas, you know, sure. Renat Fakhradinov loses. You know, he's losing 205 bucks. But I digress, sure. Ken Foe. Absolutely, <laughs> Zach Al has he just puts oh, those little nuggets yeah. in there to he's get it in my it. head. There's a little pin Take away there. my yeah. confidence. Uh, so, <laughs> Kenzo, Al Hassan uh, had a knockout of Claudio Hibero a week before Fajeda's win in January. He's now won two of three. And it seems as though for him it's going to be middleweight from here on out. What are your thoughts on him here against the undefeated Bruno Fajeda? Yeah, this is interesting, man. Um, you know, I, I think Abdul Razak uh, Al Hassan, you know, he definitely has uh, his issues on the ground. I think that's where he's always – you know, uh, struggled. And if you get a guy like Fajeda on top of you, uh, he's got some of the best ground and pound I've seen in a long time. He does not screw around when he gets that top position. He is absolutely nasty, uses great position to utilize that, that ground and pound. Now, can he get down Al Hassan consistently? I don't know. I'm a little hesitant and going with Fajeda, but I'm going to go with him. I think that hey. him getting that win over Robo, RoboCop, um, I think was huge. Uh, I think that um, 
you know, it showed that you have to respect him on the feet as well. He mm-hmm. definitely has some power. He's not the most technical guy, most skillful guy on the feet. So I could see Al Hassan uh, maybe getting a TKO or knockout there on the feet. But um, I think Fajeda is going to come into his own, get his rhythm, eventually find a way to put uh, Al Hassan on his back and, um, you know, either get a submission or, or TKO there. We love the disagreement. Opposite sides on the first two selections this week. Moving on now to lightweight. One of the Bonfim brothers is back and set to be showcased here in Vegas. Ismael Bonfim, minus 315 against Benoit Saint-Denis, who comes back plus 260. So, Bryce, Saint-Denis, man, may forever be remembered for just Mm -hmm. that beating he endured in his UFC debut against Eliseo Zaleski Dos Santos, but responded in kind, right, to Mm -hmm. stoppage wins both in 2022 your thoughts on him here, plus 260 against the talented Ismael Bonfit. Yeah, uh, Benoit Saint-Denis, which is a name I just love to say, you know what I mean? Uh, this guy's tough, right? He's 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 nails, but his wins, I, I rewatched them today, and they're just like, yeah, they're good, but they're early, and I want to see more of them, you know what I mean? Low volume, big power. Bonfit, though, him and his brother, and apparently this guy is labeled the better brother, according to experts, he looked great against Terrence McKenney. Terrence McKenney's got brick in his hands. He was not afraid at all. That knee was incredible. He's really good on the ground. St. Saint, uh, Denis likes to take the fight to the ground when he can. He's a strong guy for this weight. But Bonfrey, I think, is, is skilled everywhere. If he wasn't this high, I would go chips to the middle. But I'm playing a little conservative. You know, your boy, I don't want to get a big head. So give me Bonfrey here. No chips in the middle yet. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Bonfrey wins it. I, I Probably a decision because St. Denis is so tough. But I wouldn't be surprised if there's finish in there. Yeah, see, now you can just sort of lay back in the cut yeah, a little bit because we like, got a yeah. ball game. We got a ball yeah, game. Yeah, got to chill out a little bit. Uh, Ken Flo, Ismael Bonfim, minus 315. Benoit Santini, plus 260. Who do you like? Yeah, I, th- I thought it was a great breakdown uh, by BP. You know, um, I think the one thing that I'll add that really sticks out for me in this matchup is the athleticism of Bonfim. I, I don't think St. Denis is no slouch. Uh, and his toughness has been proven, like as you mentioned in that Dos Santos fight. Um, but Bonfim, the 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 way that he moves, uh, the way that he can recognize certain things, um, you know, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, of Topuri, the way he can get in and get out. He's very good at landing shots, getting exiting properly, assessing what's going on. He'll look at you and then he'll finish you off if he sees it. Um, I I don't know if he can get a finish against Santini, but uh, if he does. I mean, I'm all in on this kid. I, no. I think Bonfim, his athleticism to me is, is the X factor here in this one. And I think it's going to be tough for St. Denis to contend with him in that realm. All right. Both guys like Bonfim right now, minus 315 on DraftKings Sportsbook. Halfway through the main event challenge. Good time to remind you that these guys can expand their bets up to a maximum five unit play. They can also abstain from making one selection and they also can pick any fight that we don't force them to choose. All right, next up at Flyweight, we'll lead with Petrie on this one once again, but we're coming for Ken Flo later, don't you worry, Brian. <laughs> it's all good. At Flyweight, Melissa Gatto, minus 200, versus Ariane Lipsky, plus 170. Lipsky, one of a select few fighters who has been welcomed to Amanda Nunez's Lioness Studio. I saw her there a couple of weeks ago working her ass off. Uh, she's been a little bit uneven in the UFC, Bri, mm-hmm. four and five, the UFC ledger, but she has won two or three, got past J.J. Aldridge back in March and turning around quickly here. Yeah, the fight with J.J. Aldridge was great. I mean, I, I, J.J. Aldridge was a huge favorite. Lipsky looked great. Problem with this fight is, and, and it was what is going to be Lipsky's Achilles heel, is she, did get, she gets taken down and, and she can't get off her back. You look at the Montana De La Rosa fight. Montana De La Rosa, a great grappler, takes her down, can't get up, finishes her. Melissa Goddard goes for a lot of takedowns. She's good on her feet as well, but she's aggressive with the takedown. She gets on top. Could there be finished? I don't know. Lipsky training with Roger Kroll and all those guys with Amanda Nunes. You know she's going to be better. But I like Gatto here. Again, the number minus 200, I think it's playable. Women's MMA is, is, is a little in flux sometimes, so I don't know if I'm getting pushed my chips in the middle. But I'm pretty confident Melissa Gatto to get a takedown, to get a finish on the ground, some kind of submission, some kind of TKO. Um, yeah, give me Melissa Gatto. Kenny Gatto, the two-to-one favorite here. Only pro loss came in her last fight all the way back in May of 2022. Tracy Cortez, UFC 274. Gato, the chalk selection here against Ariane Lipsky. Which way are you going? 
Yeah, you know, we've mentioned it before. Um, you know, Brian did a great breakdown. I don't want to have to add a whole lot, but it takes a long time to get your grappling in order. And I think that's where Gato is going to have the big advantage here. So give me Gato again. Going very chalky here, guys. That's okay. All right, we will lead with Ken Flo on this one. Three picks to go. Featured bout at welterweight, and it features Michael Morales, minus 230. Max Griffin comes back, plus 195. So Ecuador's Morales, people forget because he hasn't fought since that TKO of Adam Fugit at UFC 277 last July, but he's been on two big cards, two pay-per-view cards. He has performed on both of them. Now back in the apex where he competed and won on Dana White's Contender Series. He's still just 24, 14-0. He was supposed to face your boy Renat Fakhradinov last December. Must have been forced out because Renat did compete that night and beat Brian Battle. Pretty big price here, Ken Flo, on Michael Morales against the UFC tested Max Griffin. Your thoughts on this one at 170 pounds? Yeah, this is a tough one. Uh, Max has a ton of experience, and there's certain fights where I think he looks awesome, and there's certain fights where I'm like, man, it's something's off, something's going on. It could be injuries or whatever. But, um, you know, I, I think that Max at his best gives Morales a tough time. Why? Because Morales is still young in the game. You know, he's literally young, but still young in the game in some ways. But, dude... I love the way he moves. Even before, like his, before he was in the UFC, you could see that he was UFC ready. Um, he's tall for the division, like lanky. The way he uh, puts it all together, he's aggressive but smart and calculated. Um, I think the sky's the limit for this kid, Morales. I, I, I really do. I, I, I like the way he puts it all together, and I think that skill wise, he's the better fighter. Um, you know, may, maybe athletic wise, he's the better fighter. I don't know if he's stronger. I think Max will be a little bit stronger. Max is going to be able to, you know, have that veteran experience to to maybe make some rounds close or steal some rounds. I think there's a lot of value on Max Griffin here. This was maybe the toughest one for me to pick, but I'll stick with Morales. Um, I'll reserve the right to maybe change the pick if I see something. But uh, I don't know. I'm high on Morales, man. I like what I've seen so far. Yeah, that's spot on analysis as far as I'm concerned. He's one of the best prospects in the UFC, and I think that's reflective in uh, Johnny Avello's price on the DraftKings Sportsbook application right now. So Max Griffin, 19 and nine overall, Bry, mm -hmm. but just seven and seven in the UFC. Now could easily, as you know, be eight and six or better. Sure. You were in the building for that fight against Neil Magny in Columbus, yeah. Ohio last year. A lot of people thought he <clears throat> deserved that nod, and had he gotten that decision, he'd be in the top twelve. He'd be on a five-fight winning streak. Wow. I mean, that absolutely killed yeah. him. He did come back and beat Timmy Means' business last October, but uh, that was a tough one for Max Griffin. So instead of being a ranked contender, uh, he's taking on Michael Morales here. What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, the, the old chest x-ray of Max Griffin will have just dogs all in there. This guy's a dog. I mean, that's what he is. I mean, this is a lose-your-money fight because I like Michael Morales, too. I like what I've seen. It has. I mean, he's won last two fights by knockout, but it wasn't like he's been – There's been, he's been hit. He's been tested in those short fights. He went through it. His movement's great. His length is great. Max's biggest problem is he gets hit. I see him closing the distance here, clinch fighting. I don't think he's going to land too many takedowns. I think Morales might land some takedowns. Max is a big, strong dude. He fights dirty on the inside. You know, he busts that dude's ear off his head that one time. That's like his grimy style. So I can see him stifling Morales here, but I think Morales taking some time off. I think he's maturing into his body. Those long guys are hard. I mean, they're, they're the leverage alone. They're, they're stronger than you think. And I think he, he's going to have a little bit harder in the clinch than then uh, Max is probably expecting it on the feet if at distance. I mean, Morales has all the tools. I'm high on Morales as well. Give me Morales. Another chalk selection. I'm just going to follow Kenny just so I don't I don't slip up. But, uh, no, give me Morales. I do like this kid a lot. He's, he's very, very talented. Yeah, don't screw this up now, kid. You're back no, in, I can't. I can't. Back in business. No. <laughs> all right, co-headliner, Demir Ismagulov, minus 130. Grant Dawson, plus 110. So here's a quote from Ismagulov in January, Bri. Due to circumstances mm -hmm. and health problems, I am forced to end my sports career. He has postponed that retirement, and that is a very good sign in terms of his health. He had won 19 in a row before he was outpointed by the credentialed Armand Sarukyan last December. On the other side, you got Grant Dawson with plus a plus number next to his name. 19-1-1 one one overall submitted Marco Madsen his last time out. That made him 7-0-1 oh in the big show. Certainly that move to American top team has paid dividends for Grant mm -hmm. Dawson. Plus 110 here against Demir Ismagulov. Brian Petrie, who do you like in the co -main? 
So I hate when a fighter, I mean, I don't know what the health issue was, but he's one foot out, one foot in. Now he's back. You know, he has won some fights by the skin of his teeth as well. Great career outside the UFC. His old topology picture, he had like fucking 50 belts. Like this guy's accomplice, right? And I faded Grant Dawson pretty much his whole career. I don't really love his stand up, but then he goes out there and out wrestles Mark Madsen, who's a silver, you know, silver medal Olympus, uh, and submits him. He goes out there and he, he's just a big guy, and he goes out there and he muscles dudes down, and he's heavy on top. He's good on the ground. Can he do that against his, his Magulov? Possibly. And when you got a one foot in, one foot out fighter who I think could dominate on the feet, and I think Grant Dawson working with that great team is going to hopefully work his stand up to get it to the ground. He's got to mix everything together. This is mixed martial arts. You're hanging plus 110 on a guy always faded. I'm going to take that. You know what? This playing it safe bullshit isn't for me. Not my kind, not my cup of tea. Give me two units on uh, Grant Dawson at the underdog price, babe. Let's go. All right. A two unit trigger on Grant Dawson by Brian Petrie at plus 110. So that is $200 to yield 220. Uh, Ken Flo, will you have any action on the co-main event, sir? I will. Um, yeah, this is a tough one, man. I think I think Dawson um, has made big strides uh, in regards to connecting his wrestling with his jujitsu, and you know, getting guys to the ground in, in a more efficient manner. I, it, it was evident, anyways, in his last fight. But um, Isma Gulov's a good wrestler, man. I, I think it's he's not going he's not going to give up those takedowns easily. Um, I, I think that uh, you know. That fight against Armand Sarukian exposed a lot of things in some ways, right? And where hopefully he's looking at that and going, okay, this is where I need to shore up my my defenses and this and that. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't necessarily see Grant Dawson doing the same thing that Sarukian did, um, but he is a different fighter. I, I think that he's much more of a submission threat. Um, and if he does get the back, is Magulov's going to be in trouble I just don't see him getting there or getting there for, for long enough. I think Isma Gulov is going to find a way to utilize that reach, keep Dawson on the outside, fight off those takedowns, and, um, and, and win by decision here. All right, Kemflo likes Demir Ismagulov minus 130, and that brings us to the main event. These guys are forced to predict every main event per Arizona Diamondback Evan Longoria. So <laughs> it's Sean Strickland minus 175, Abus Magomedov plus 150, Kenny, any familiarity for you with Magomeda from the PFL? I know he did fight Sadabu C, I believe. Was that before your time? That was before my time, okay. yes, sir. So yep. here he gets a, a main event slot. Now, he's a finisher, did have some fights canceled this year against Gerald Murchard and then Mahmoud Muradov in February and March, respectively. And I believe it was a Muradov injury. So he's being elevated here against Sean Strickland, Bry, who mm -hmm. has headlined four of his last five. Now he's won three of those, right? Good five-round style, three and one in UFC main events, getting a fifth one here. Below two to one. What are your thoughts on mm -hmm. Strickland against the uh, credential, but less so Abus Magomedov? Yeah, this was this was a head scratcher for a lot of people that Magomedov got this slot here. I mean, he looked great in his debut, big big knockout uh, against a low level competition. I watched all his PFL career. He he has good striking. He's long. He's got those long arms. Grappling's on point. He did get knocked out by Lewis Taylor, who's who's primarily a grappler. So that kind of is in my head though. Even though Sean Strickland's not the biggest puncher, Sean Strickland though this guy doesn't do. do um, strength and conditioning. He fights. That's what he spars a hundred rounds. Like it's nuts, old school style. And that's why he's so comfortable in there. His style is a little weird. Chin up, hands kind of weird position, but it works for him, right? And volume and volume and volume is what is what's gonna win him this fight. I like Sean Trickham big here. Um, I like him to just drown a boost later in this fight. Uh, I mean, obviously, Sean's been caught before. He's got knocked out Pereira, he's been knocked out by uh Alessius Dos Santos. A while ago at 170. He's never been taken down at 185 pounds. Sean Strickland, that his takedown offense has always been known to be great. He could make some takedowns in himself. I doubt that's going to happen. I just see volume, 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 drowned him. Wouldn't be surprised if we get a late round finish if, if Magomedov has zero gas tank. But I, I like Strickland by decision here. Uh, pretty confident as well. Kenny Sean Strickland minus 175. I boost Mago Meta plus 150. Who do you like? Yeah, this is an interesting one because, you know, like what Brian alluded to, uh, it never gives me great confidence when I see Strickland go out there and compete just because he always seems vulnerable to uh, eating a shot. His hands are quite low, you know, his chin up in the air, uh, but he makes it work. He really does. It also you know, having a great chin and being tough as nails definitely helps. Um, but um, 
Yeah, so I, I think it really does come down to whether his style is going to hold up against someone like Magomedov. I think that it certainly can. Um, you know, experiencing that level of pressure and pace and volume can definitely wear on you, and Strickland can definitely do that for 25 minutes. And I think in a guy in Magomedov who hasn't had those big fights, hasn't had high-level competition, um, I, I think it might overwhelm him. Um, or he's good enough, like he showed in his last fight, that he does land one of those shots and 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 finishes him off. He might be that good. Um, but in, I, I, for me, I want to see that consistently against good competition, and I just haven't seen that. I can only go on you know, based on what I've seen, and I like Strickland here as well. All right, both guys like Sean Strickland. He could be had right now at minus 175. Brian Petrie, before we let you fly, any remaining preliminary selections? You know, I don't have one because the two guys that I like, I like Garam Kutsalate and I like Johannes Ambrito. They're both minus 500, minus 800 probably. So that's not worth giving out. Put them together, a little parlay, a couple unis, we're good. But as far as a, a selection, no, I don't have one. And if you want me to sort of widen the scope of the main event challenge in 2024 to allow you in this instance to do a two-legger. We could talk about sure. that uh, okay, on yeah, the other can, line, but uh, sure, sure, sure. for now, it's MMA Takes Podcast if you want that noise and on social yeah. media at Brian Petrie MMA. Much love, brother. Thanks for all the support uh, privately and otherwise this weekend. You're the man. We will uh, we'll talk to you in advance of the big one. You know what it is, UFC 290 in a week. Thanks, boys. Johnny, you're a soldier for doing this, but I know you've had a hell of a day, but thanks, boys. You too, my man. Thank you so much. Brian Petrie with us for the main event challenge. All right. One thing that I just wanted to say in closing, I'm just going to take 60 seconds to do this. So, you know, I voiced a lot of support for Charles Oliveira over the last three weeks. And my life's work is supporting and promoting and building up all of these athletes. So I don't consider myself to be all that sensitive now, 12, 13 years into my run as a UFC commentator. But one thing I take issue with is people suggesting that because I put over Charles that I can't now support Islam Akashev. And I do believe that my track record speaks for itself, that if you were to go on Instagram and ask your favorite fighter or some random fighter how they've been treated by me over the years, I do believe that most of them have felt individualized support from me over the years. And I can just tell you, even since Saturday night, right, I have been messaged by two losing fighters, right, Cody Brundage and Bruno Silva, and I will have long-form conversations to try to help build those guys back up, right? I've also had a conversation with Beef Wellington Terman's coach, Plinio Cruz, right, let them know I thought he fought really well in a tough welterweight debut, right? So behind the scenes, I'm constantly trying to build up this entire roster. So if you listen to this podcast and hear me having fun with my guy, Ken Flo, and say, Charles Oliveira might be my favorite fighter, like, please don't make the leap that I am not supporting Islam Akasha because I take this stuff very seriously. And at the end of the day, um, but one man trying to support 700 fighters and, uh, I can't be perfect. So I just want to get that out there to try to address some of that Oliveira stuff in advance of his potential title fight in October. Well said. You mean fans are, are jumping to huh. conclusions yeah. and just going nuts on you? That's weird. I've never heard that. And the notion oh, that somehow man. I was anti-Habib, you know, uh, please go check the record on that well, front. Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, knowing you for a long time, it's like John play. John does such a good job of like playing sides really, really well, in my opinion, and especially like, calling fights of being neutral during fights. I think you do that extremely well. And, um, you know, again, it's like people think because you're, you know, in favor of some guy or you like a certain guy, it doesn't mean that you don't right. like the other guy and people don't get that right. Yeah. I mean, again, that's probably the most common uh, critique on any commentator yeah, i think yeah. people just go the other way so anyways yeah. yeah well thank you buddy and again never had a perfect show never will right i messed up m fam this weekend sorry to zach candido and everybody else on that <laughs> i knew it was m fam but I, I somehow said m f a m so i apologize to the gaming community on that but yeah do you know how much it means to me to have a guy like bruno silva message me after a loss yeah. and say hey man tough one i hope the company enjoyed it you know it's like because he feels like there's an outlet there you know i right. want to try to be that guy you know and sure. to be approachable uh, and if you're a UFC fighter who listens to this, you know, my DMs are hundred percent open. All right. If you want more on the show, anikflorianpodcast.com. Don't forget to check out everything on the DraftKings YouTube channel. See what we got going on with the DraftKings network as well. Also, don't forget, remember the show. That game show has never been better. It's live every Thursday with Bilal Muhammad and my twin bro, Jason Anik on the Anik and Florian podcast channel. Follow Argus Integrated Defense on Instagram, especially if you want to waste a lot of time like me. My wife's like, are you on Kenny's? 
defense Instagram page again. I'm like, I'm sorry, honey. She's like, why don't you go like train or like do something to make yourself more of a threat? than just to go down that rabbit hole. So Argus Integrated Defense, Kenny Flory, MartialArts.com, and our UFC 290 One More Sleep limited edition designs are available at millions.co. All right. Thank you to our guests, Ray Longo and Brian Petrie. Thanks so much to our great producer, Cody Merrill, always ready, willing, and able whenever we need him. And uh, I hope Beef Wellington term and sticks, but it's the wrong time for the nickname when he's dropping down to 170 pounds. Thanks for being with us. For Ken Flom, John Anik, we will talk to you next week in advance of International Fight Week 2023. Until then, you'll later.